Discography, the music podcast that delivers the objective truth about the entire discography of every single artist and band that ever existed. I'm your host, Dave Gebro, and in this episode, we'll be turning our spray cans back on the Jesus Lizard, <laughs> along with our very special guest, No Ages, Randy Randall. This is part two of a two-parter spectacular. If you're tuning in for the first time, I quit my job a couple months back while putting the Pavement series together because I do it all, from obtaining the guests, doing all the social media, all the recording and editing, you name it. We're a year in and there's a real audience building. Six-figure downloads in 70 countries, consistently ranked in the top 30 music commentary podcasts. And so now I'm in free fall mode on a serious mission. So why am I telling you this? because I'm doubling down on Discography. My wife and I are in the process of selling our house and we'll be driving to the East Coast this winter to live frugally with our four-year-old and all of that just to ensure that Discography is the standard bearer for all that's awesome about music. So don't go anywhere when this episode's done. Subscribe. Coming up, we have Trip to Fantasy, the two and a half hour greatest sleep albums of all time holiday super mix premiering on Christmas Day, not to mention soul-bearing interviews with the Wrecking Crew's legendary Don Randy and Foxygen's Jonathan Rado, Sergio Diaz from Os Mutantis rating his own early work, a brand new Patreon member guested series called We Are Stardust, We Are Over, about the four least fortunate acts that played Woodstock, and on and on and on, way, way into the future. And all of this while we're plowing 3,000 miles through the snow so you can rock on uninterrupted in the style to which you become accustomed. Hey guys, throw me a bone here. I need your help. Check out all the back episodes and share the ones you dig with your friends. Also, join our Facebook group, Discography Soldiers of Sound. We're on Instagram and Twitter, too, in case you don't mess with the Zuck. Also, please rate the podcast five stars, especially if you're listening to the show on good old Amazon Music or Spotify, Apple, YouTube, or anywhere else for that matter. It'll help a lot. You can find the link to our legendary playlist in the show notes and also on our website at discography.com. And if you're like me and enough's just never enough, then visit patreon.com slash discography and become one of our Patreon soldiers of sound. Our Patreon feed is the ultimate music deep dive. I post three shows a week, the main show on Sunday, then Discography's The Private Press with Paul Major on Tuesdays, and a Thursday wildcard episode, which is either an interview with that week's guest or one of our other offshoot shows like Rock Cousteau, Queasy Listening, Rick's Backyard, and Battle Royale. So hey, give it a shot. Because honestly, the Sunday show is only the gateway drug. A deeper dive beckons. Okay, back to business. First things first, you need to know just how seriously I take this craziness. Discography is heavily researched, and the music is always reassessed with fresh ears. Even the bad stuff. Especially the bad stuff. We're not just covering albums. Uh Uh-uh. We do a searingly honest deep dive analysis of all EPs, singles, comp tracks, relevant solo work, and some bootlegs. Every release is slapped with an objectively accurate star rating between 0 and 5, which allows us all. The real reason we do this, the Tootsie Pop reward at the center of the rock and roll lolly, to come face to face with the true shape of an artist's overall arc. And away we go then with Randy Randall as we punch through to some serious, raging, full-on truth about the Jesus Lizard. 1992, Liar. So this is their third album, uh, again, on Touch and Go, uh, considered to be among among their their best records. It's not the the craziest or most fucked up album they ever made, but... Uh, it's very consistent. Let's start with Boilermaker, just like they did. Oh, so good, right? I'm getting classic, you know, the playlists and, you know, the, to go on live in the live sets. You know, I've never seen them live where they didn't play this song. Um, same with Here Comes Dudley. I mean, really knowing how to how to start off a song or how to start off a record, right? Where this is, a, where, the, where Goat starts with like the, the steamroller thing. This is, this right. is rod, yeah. we're off and running, right? A full sprint. This kind of feels like, uh, like a light version like with some of the edge sanded off mm. like it like in other words <clears throat> it's a good solid rock song instead of feeling like something more dangerous than that 
And there's nothing wrong with that. It's just more, it's only rock and roll than Exile on Main Street. Right, right. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm with you. Yeah, I don't think that doesn't have the smoke and the, the sleaze yet. Yeah. You know, that That's to come. But I guess, and I would have to imagine, I don't know, because I don't know, I didn't look up what their touring schedules were, but this sounds like a band who has not been off the road for more than two days. It right, sounds right. like a band who's just touring nonstop. Right. You mean in terms of how tight they are? Yeah. And just, and just how confident they are and how, in you know, where they put the songs, you know, I mean, this, it, it, the records like um, set like a live set list, you know what I mean? It's like, it, right. it mimics this kind of thing. Like they know what they do and they know what they do well and how they pace it out and what goes into where, you know what I mean? It just feels yeah. like maybe it's a feeling, you, you know, I've, I've, you experience as being a band on the tour on, on the road, but tour tight is a thing. And when and, right. and the hope is you always want to go into a, rec- a recording situation and, you know, like where, where you can forget the song, you just play it without thinking it. Right. And this, this almost sounds like what they're do- doing. You know, it's, it's all muscle memory at this point. There's right. No right. Just, yeah. it's just, we press play and let's go. The band is going to perform for 45 minutes without stopping and <laughs> taking a breath. Yeah. The second song, I think, is Whoa. one of their absolute all-time great songs. I mean, it v- very much a contender for their absolute best. Gladiator yeah. is so fucking shredded that the guitars actually, to me, sound like downed power lines shooting at sparks. Oh, what a, great, that, what a great way to put it. Yep. And, and that, just talking about the, and that, that bass, right? that's the bass, yeah, that's yeah. the Jesus Lizard, that's the Albini bass drums, you know, if you, again, if you needed like uh, an example of that, you know, the first 10 seconds of what that's yeah. doing. Just, yeah, it's great. And I mean, like, you know, in, in referencing uh, Eraser before, Ooh. that's again, like a, a similar kind of a thing where it's like, you're just trying to like hang on for dear life. Because um, <laughs> even Eraser is a very interesting structure. There's no... There's no chorus, right? Right. Yeah, kind of. Yeah. It's like uh, several iterations of an intro and then a bunch (laughs) of verses and it's done, right? (laughs) Yeah. 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 I think, yeah, yeah, we're definitely, we're definitely at that point of uh, where we're we're not aware of writing songs and what we're doing. I think it was, yeah, we kind of just collect, collect all the sounds that sound good together and then stop when it's over. But that's where your mastery of tension and release to me sets you completely apart from a band like this who are just uh you know uh feel uncom- possibly uncomfortable in their bodies and uncomfortable on the planet in a way that doesn't allow for texture it only allows for thrashing around uh trying to make as big of a commotion as as is possible. That's interesting. You said, I mean, think from a constructionist sort of point of view, right? Like this is the the steel girder irons of a building. Like we don't need walls. We don't need windows. We just need the, the, the pieces we need to survive. Right. We right. Need the, yeah. And that's, you know, so when you talk about tension and release eraser is almost unbearably filled with that because, oh. and, and it's really, really beautifully reflected back in the video that, tension which is never released until later in the song Mm. is mirrored by you guys constantly running up to that backyard stage to play over (laughs) and over and over again so you're not actually quite playing you're almost playing the whole way through oh man well it's 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 too kind i don't know if i have a an an objective opinion on on any of that stuff and or even to include it next to or inside of a jesus lizard (laughs) podcast Uh, Uh, reflection i feel i feel i feel dwarfed by the subject matter not at all no 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 eraser you know uh objectively speaking which is the only kind of speaking we do here (laughs) uh is as good of a rock song as has ever been recorded Oh, I, I can I can't agree with you, but I can appreciate that. I can be I can be uh, empathetic to what to what you said. But thank you. You're you're very welcome. Thank you. <laughs> um, and I'm not dwelling on the past with you guys. I have every fucking thing you guys. Oh have. no, thanks. I, I'm so into talking about Jesus Lizard. I feel too humble to to even talk about myself. Nah, nah. Okay. So art of self defense. Yeah, Let's art of self defense. Yeah. Uh, let's first talk about the line, a diminutive figure in a filthy loincloth is en route to your house just to knock you off. I mean, <laughs> who, that's so fucking weird, man. This song is brutally intense. Yeah, it's great. I mean, I think, you know, again, like, I think it just speaks to his, you know, again, the, the many faces of David Yao and sort of what he talks about. We talked to, you know, we'll go with kind of the body horror stuff. Right. This is almost like an, an, an Elmer Leonard, a noir, you know, sort of character. This is an amazing song. Slave Ship 
Slave Ship is a really cool. I don't really love love it musically as much, but I love the idea that this is a sort of uh, astoundingly brutal version of Randy Newman's Sail Away. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. I think it, it swings in a way. I think is funny. It almost reminds you like being in the bottom of a ship or something. Yeah, yeah. Right. There's a very yeah. kind of swinging sort of thing, which, again, yeah, I think it speaks a little bit of the cow punk you know, sort of thing they do with real reverby twangy guitars, but plotting bass and drums. I like the plotting Jesus Lizard, but not nearly as much as the other kind of Jesus Lizard. I like the, right, the release, yeah. not the tension from these guys. Right, right. Well, again, which brings you to Puss. Which right. Again, all right. release. Give me something yep. to stop the bleeding. And, and that's oh. what I wrote next to it is perfect yeah. song. This was the split single with Nirvana. Oh, right. Yes, I have this. I inherited this from my older brother. Oh, no shit. Yeah, yeah, with the poodles. And again, kind of look, it kind of the artwork on this one is cat's heads on a Renaissance type of classical painting. And then that cover Gross. is, uh, again, that's the the, um, the poodle head. Maybe that's what, yeah, I was referencing. Puss and Oh the Guilt, right? Is the, mm -hmm. is, that's is right. The... That's right. We'll get, to, we'll get to that after this. Okay, okay. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. The, the, the B Puss side. Great. Yes. Uh, the the B side after Puss, I believe it's a sing, it's a Dix cover, right? Dix cover, yeah, yeah. I have that. I have that one. That's uh, that's a great. That's a fucked up cover too. Yeah, it is. The second half of Liar, I'm not as impressed by. I like Rope, mm -hmm. but, but then uh, on that second side, you got Whirl, Perk, and Zachariah, which are just, I think decent without being yeah correct. rope rope is that kind of again cow punk sort of thing and i can imagine you know it's a, again a live band the song like this goes off right you can play this live yeah, yeah, yeah. and everybody loses their shit right perk is yeah kind of this languid again yeah i think very country kind of thing it's funny thinking about it these are just kind of less zachariah is like pastoral mm -hmm. I think I like Zachariah that. is kind of pastoral, mm -hmm. right? You can almost make a playlist of their sort of their long, their long spread out songs. Similar thing, but pastoral is a much better song. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. I think you're right. Dance Naked Ladies, though. That's the, that's one of their best songs. Yep. That yeah. is, you know. So they, they learned from the goat, right? Don't put the weak one at the end. Exactly. <laughs> Where goat was fast and furious, this one's kind of up and down and all over the place. Mm -hmm. You know, I love just about every other song. And the Skipperoos, they're not insultingly bad or anything. They're just kind of failed stylistic semi-deviations. To me, this just feels so live. I could see this is how you would put a live set together. You mm -hmm. want you want some dynamics in there, and then you want songs that are just going to get people up and moving, even yeah. if they're not the thing you need to document for posterity's sake for the rest of your career. You know, right. but you know you know right. that that's going to fill mm -hmm. you know four minutes in a set, and everyone's going to be sweaty and dead, and then you can go into your longer piece after that. It's right. like you want to ratchet them up. Yeah, yeah th this one overall, I, I, I give it three and a half. Oh, yeah. So, okay, what did I, I did five for Goat. I'm going to put Liar at four and a half. Four and a half? Yeah. Oh, you definitely like this one better. Because, I mean, there's so there's so many great, you know, classic songs that would go on to kind of be, you know, the, the staple of, of who they are as a band. The Boilermaker, Gladiator, Art of Self-Defense, uh, Dancing Naked Ladies, you know, I think pus even i think i don't know i think there's some great stuff in there we're on the same page but i believe that you're more forgiving because every single song you just mentioned except for dancing naked ladies was on yeah. side one right right it runs out of steam a little bit i think i'm still writing the high off a go and i also have the, yeah, yeah. the 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 age i was at when i heard this you know yeah. I, I think i give him a wide berth you would be backstabbing time. the 11 year old randy randall <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. i couldn't put yeah i can't really yeah i can't really see it. so i think you know i think really go liar down are the like the sweetest spots and then i kind of retroactively put head in there too because i didn't know it as well right. you know i was bad with that but those four records i mean this this is where we're, we're in the sweet spot so we're goat i think just kicks it off liar steps down and then down i think almost comes back i don't know we'll, we'll get to that spot um and here's where they fly closest to the sun mm. the guilt single the split single uh released February 15th, 1993. Is this the height of Nirvana? It has to be, right? This is like... Nevermind came out in September 91, I think. But 92 belonged to, to, oh, yeah, yeah. to Nirvana. 92. 92 was the whole year yeah. of them, right? They couldn't they couldn't do... That was where... You know, even that came that comes out September, but doesn't really catch on. It was still... It was the world right. where it wasn't instantaneous the week of. I don't think Nirvana... I don't think Nevermind really took off. 
till, till right. Christmas buying season. I imagine a million people bought that for Christmas or, you know, kids got that or their parents got that for them for a Christmas presents. Yeah. And we're and well in by this point because, yeah. you know, we're talking about mid February 93. Somehow the matrix was, was jammed because this band got to breathe superstar air for a little bit. It was recorded uh, February 13th, 93. So, in utero. Yeah. Okay, and this comes out February 15th, 93. That's correct. So, Whatever yeah, we're, we're right in it with in utero. They don't want to be the biggest band in the world. They want to have integrity in some right. ways, you know, but they, they work with Albini. They do a split with Jesus Lizard. They're trying their best to anchor, to, to nail their feet to something of solid ground. Yeah. And, and it just won't, and, you know, whatever forces at play in their world just won't allow them to ever feel like they're human beings. They have to be gods. The interesting thing about the Jesus Lizard is that they're so painfully, irreducibly uh, not of that stripe when they start consorting <clears throat> with major label types and 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 you know trying to find a middle ground, it so doesn't work. I mean, it, oil it, and water, right? Just, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I I could have seen G.S. Lizard on you know David Letterman or or whatever you know the the MTV sort of world. I think there was enough there. There was there was enough meat on the bone, but I guess. I don't know. I think the juggernaut of that major label world was um, was so like blotting out the sun if for anything new or interesting to happen. I just don't think, you know, I think it's interesting because even, you know, same could be said with a band like the Melvins or something like the post Nirvana sort of like indie gold rush mm -hmm. sort of thing. It was not it was not really there was no room for um for interest, for interesting right. things, they were they were all looking for the the next one hit wonders, a la whatever Green Day or something, which really had nothing to do with the Nirvana, but it just happens to come like who are the who are the best who are the best looking kids we can pimp out and sort of put them on the cover of magazines and make them the Donny Osmonds of the nineties, right? And that's what it's more how I look at. It. They weren't looking for interesting things; they were looking for good looking kids with baggy or with uh, ripped jeans and you know some something but these these were not fashion. good kids no they weren't right so i could see yeah i can I, I forget you know i could i, I mean mac mac yeah. was like vaguely dream but they're not <laughs> they're not they're not known for that kind of it shit wasn't and, that you know, thing and even like you look like a band like a trent Reznor, gorgeous man right you yeah. know what i mean he's like you know there's these are style icons i think if anything the 90s was hobbled by good looking rock stars and which I'm sure is always the case of pop music and big things, but just you look at all of the the music that that really crossed over. I think I don't know why. Maybe it's just it's just never really mentioned. You know, I think people don't really it's it seemed gauche or or, or passe to 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 talk about this sort of stuff. But you know, the popular band like Tom York again, this kind of you know always got a lazy eye, but the man's a tiny waif of a you know he looks like a, a model. These are all yeah. model you know, lead front man, Chris Cornell, whatever, you know, you know, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So, so I guess, yeah, I guess they, they were not allowed to taste the, um, the, the, the popular media outlets due to, you know, look, I, I, I honestly believe, and I've thought this for, for years that the record companies in boardrooms, you know, that we, we never get to see into that every now and then they decide, okay, this thing, this entity, this Jesus lizard, they're doing this thing that operates outside the boundaries of what we decide is allowable. Mm. So <clears throat> let's see if we can uh, infiltrate some rot into the proceedings and break them down and, and fuck them up. I, I honestly believe that this is a well, conscious thing. Right. Well, you, then you get into like your MK Ultra sort of. So that's a governmental sort of program. But you think that even right. in, a, in a capitalist sort of way of anything of of interest in freewheeling dynamics that is, that exists and is able to make money outside of their world is. I mean, you're who? Yeah, I'm sure there was some version of that. Right. What is it? The the Powell Doctrine that you know the capitalism must be defended at all costs. Yeah. You know, there, there no way can capitalism be be um attacked and it's the government's responsibility to uh defend capitalism and yeah. that you know the same sort of thing that like if anything that seeks seems to be popular that is not w under our own control we're, yeah i mean that would be interesting i'm sure there's a book written about it but even you know the sense of like mp3s in essence torpedo like they almost shot themselves in the foot with that and then and then to revive it into into streaming where where now the, the, the mechanics are back in balance when major labels are able to profit 
you know, get the lion's share. There's a great, uh, there's a great line in an unreleased Bob Dylan song uh, called Farewell, Angelina. What, what cannot be imitated perfectly must die. Mm. And, and, and that's what I think that, that Jesus, I mean, obviously there had been punk bands before this. There had been, <clears throat> but these guys had uh, something inviolable to them. Uh, it's like if there was no corrosion that had seeped into it, these guys could have potentially kept going, you know, ad infinitum. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think, I think you're right. It's, and it's, and I think this is that point, right. Where you sort of introduced that, the idea of now that the, the touch, the taste of Nirvana and that world and that everyone rushes into them into, right. you know, and wants a piece of what they have. There's, there's, there's the Lollapalooza, there's the Capitol records. We're, we're not quite there. We're no, all... no, but, but I think this is the, this is the, the, the chink in the armor, right. Or this is yeah. the crack, yes. the crack that be, that will become the, the chasm that will become the grand Canyon. It starts here. There's, right. there's a seed exactly happens. yeah and so, okay what's next there's a couple there's a couple of releases that that occurred before we have to contend with that so in 1993 the lash ep came out okay we're, oh, we're not going to talk wheelchair epidemic or gladiator that came out in between in between liar and Damn. lash Damn. wheelchair epidemic then was a standalone single yeah yeah and the cover art's horrible it's like a it's like somebody having sex with like a, a wheelchair patient with like a dunce cap on. Mm -hmm. It's it's very disturbing. So did you have this single when it came out? The, I, it, this was something I inherited from my brother after my brother passed. I got right. you know his records and, and a guitar and stuff. So I had this in there. And again, very kind of like challenging, you know, artwork and stuff. But I put it on, but it's a great dun 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 You know, they really make it sound like a like a um, Jesus Lizard song. The original right. is not quite as um menacing and and <laughs> tension field filled. You know, they added their their stamp to it. What do you what do you give it? Uh wheelchair epidemic. I mean, again, what's what's what was it backed with? I'm trying to see what is it. I'm um, actually not sure. Horrifyingly enough, out. I didn't, I, didn't, <laughs> I didn't rate this one. Oh, okay. Well, I get, yeah, I'm giving it, I'm giving it a five. Great. You, Great you band. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I'm going to go two and three quarters and I'll let you know if I'm right or wrong. <laughs> okay. To that. be updated. All right. The Lash EP in 1993. Oh, right. Okay. So this is where I come in in real time, right? This is where young Randy Randall first crosses right. over with the Lash EP. Th this one kind of has awesome. stopgap written all the fuck over it to me. Right. I mean, this is, this is a band who's probably on tour all the time and can't, and, and there's a demand for right. more material. It's kind of like two mediocre watered down new studio tracks and then a smattering of live leftovers. Yeah. There's right. No but again, this is po po in the wake of that Nirvana single. It's just, you could, they couldn't put enough product out there. Everything's probably selling. So just put new stuff, new stuff, new stuff. The two new songs, I don't really love either of them. Glamorous and Deaf as a Bat. Come on, Glamorous, that opening riff is great. With that drums, I always love when anybody does a rim shot on a drum. You know, that's where like the, the drumstick is like, you know, um, just hitting the, the rim shot. And, you know, because yeah, yeah. I think that's the Glamorous. That, that's, I love that, iconic. And that's where, and that also comes into their live record. That's sort of the Glamorous I love. Deaf as a Bat is kind of another rockabilly kind of, Warren Burner, not my favorite. Yeah, that one but, kind of feels crampsy to me. But the Killer McCann live is great. Lady Shoes live, Bloody Mary live, Monkey Trick live. Like I said, the Monkey Trick live, the last track on this thing, is my first sort of blush with the band. This is five out of five for me. I mean, just okay. just yeah, respect is, respecting my own personal biography with yeah, the band. Yeah. This is great. And that cover, too. Again, that is a giant piece of art. If that was existed eight feet by eight feet, I would have it <laughs> hanging on my wall. I would pay thousands of dollars that's awesome. such a thing yeah no, i love that and it's funny because you know i'm obviously i'm hearing it as a 50 year old man yeah yes it's totally passing over me i i give it two and a quarter stars okay oh so oh, so show let's get back to this okay yeah, yeah. don cab the damned jesus Lizard in between at cbgb's i mean mm -hmm. really legendary I, all those things were lost on me at the time because i didn't wasn't aware of all that cool stuff yeah really love this record what's your take on it from hearing it cold it's a good live record it didn't necessarily leap out to me like it was an exceptional live record but certainly uh, a solid representation of uh the the racket they'd been making during the decade i have to say honestly for, for me personally this is probably the yardstick i know i said goat was yeah, I think so many of these songs come from Goat, but I would say this no shit. Is, the, is the representation that I really probably the record I've listened to the most. And when I, if I want to go back to Jesus Lizard, 
this is where I would go first. And I know I'm an oddball for that. You know, the goat, it would be the go-to thing to most, most people, but for whatever reason, I think it was, again, the more, the more the biography of my life at the time, yeah. this was really, what it, hit you? it hit me so hard. And, and it's funny because there's this record and uh, Velvet Underground with Lou Reed, uh, 1969, that, mm. that live compilation from oh, yeah. uh, Dallas and, and San Francisco. Yeah. I love that record more than any other Velvet Underground record. <laughs> that no, but that I understand. Yeah, to me that's, that's not strange. First of all, that version of what goes on is the oh, it's the it's best great. version that exists of that song. Yeah, and then there's this really interesting sort of corn pone uh, uh, country take on "I'm Waiting for the Man," which is <laughs> fucking amazing. And he's talking about sports as a oh yes. Yeah, I don't know about we saw your Dallas Cowboys down there. Yeah, the yeah. Yard line. Like, all right, yeah. Like, just like, a, might as well give them a chance to win or something. All like, right, here we go. That's a phenomenal live album. Again, yeah, all the stuff, all the banter that he says in the beginning, like, all right, you guys got to go to work in the morning. Are we? Can we? Can we do a short set? Or are we going to stretch right, out real right. long? You're like, okay, pull out whatever makes you you know relax, whatever helps you you know pass the time in this world. Yeah. You know, here we go. And they do that that one side of of heroin, ocean, and pale blue eyes. Is mm -hmm. that what it is? Yeah, oh, yeah, phenomenal. Three songs taking up, you know, whatever that is, 15, 20 minutes. Is yeah, just that, gorgeous, that is so that's incredible. Out. It's Dude. way better than Max's Kansas City, or yeah, that I understand completely. This one, I, I only heard it once, got uh, it. I right, yeah. go back and, and re listen. Um, but ultimately, I think if I was, uh, nothing would supersede Goat as far as a platonic ideal for sure. me, sure. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. But I think, yeah, this was just kind of where I hit. And I think I know a lot of these songs from this. And I think that then, you know, and then kind of, and then just feeling, I like, feeling like I have to see them live. I have to see them live and then seeing them at the Roxy there in 95 definitely fulfilled that. And then in these, the subsequent two reunion tours that I saw them, it just, you yeah. know, I think it just puts me at this moment because I have these songs living live in my head and, right. and the fun of it all. I really hope I get to see them, dude. I'm so late to the party. Yeah, it was, it was, it was funny. I'm probably not, you know, probably speaking out of school and who knows what's worth anything to say, but when I was at that Lance Bangs thing, I was talking with Watt because in because they'd practiced at, at Watt's pad, you know, with Brit and, and Paho for all the stuff they did. And he mentioned and Watt was talking about he's like, oh yeah. And I was like, what's David doing here? I was like, oh he's gonna sing on a song. Like, okay, that's odd. And then um and he's like, oh yeah, he's been in Nashville playing with Dwayne. I think they're working on a new Jesus Lizard record. And I was like, whoa. And then I and then as I was talking to David, I was like, oh Watt mentioned, you know, new music. He's like, well I wouldn't call it that. I don't know. I, don't know. I wouldn't I wouldn't get I wouldn't get too excited. And I was like, okay, I won't hold my breath. But <laughs> But what a what an insight! I mean, that would be that would be huge. That would be uh, all right. So 1994 down. Yes, so this is uh, this is a turning point. It's their last album for Touch and Go, and the yeah. last to be produced by Steve Albini. And the last with Mac also on it, right? Is the last Mac on? I believe so. I believe you're yeah. right. Yeah. Uh, so things were about to change uh irretrievably for these guys so another piece of shit album cover <laughs> that <laughs> dog i mean just think about it right he's falling he's not gonna make it i think this is i think the band knew in some ways too that this was I the like breaking it. point i think they could have broken up here and this would have been the end of and you know what i mean this is the cherry on top of, of an amazing career i'm glad they didn't break up but this one is yeah extremely up and down for me what, what, mm. what's your what's your thoughts in general about down so again i talk about you know this is where i saw them live i feel like i was i was drifting on fumes a little bit you know what i mean but they mm. played the songs i knew you know so i was digging that and so i kind of you know loop in these songs into that kind of like hey those were cool too they played those right. fly on the wall you know it was fun the lyrics aren't particularly yeah, it, fly on the wall know, sounds more. muted and yao sounds distracted to me yeah countless uh, backs of sad losers well, let's, let's hold okay, up. Okay, okay, we'll hold go. Up yeah, for, hold up for yeah. Mistletoe. because that, oh, Yeah, Mistletoe. That, that mistletoe yeah. is just about the only song I love on the first side. Okay, yeah. Or actually, Mistletoe and Destroy Before a Reading. Yeah. It almost has like a Dead Kennedys kind of thing, right? I guess we haven't really talked oh, about yeah. Dead Kennedys in reference to that sort of twangy cowboy sort of stuff. I think there's that's got to be part of the equation, or at least people could hear that. I'm going to put the Geiger penis landscape poster in with your wallpaper. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> I'll take it. Uh, but yeah, mistletoe is good. Again, yeah, bouncy kind of thing. But again, right. It's like they're, they're drifting a little bit where they had such definitive, confident statements of records with goat and liar. I think they're drifting. Yeah. I mean, because yeah. the, the look, three songs in a row that were for me a miss. Callous backs, a sad losers, queen for a day and the associate. 
I honestly don't care. What was going on here? Do you think, or don't you know? Uh, yeah, the associates. Because well. I don't know as far as what they were distracted by. What were they up against at this point? It just seems like uh, the music is more of an afterthought now. Well, I have to imagine, right? It's the it's the glow of the the, the intense spotlight, right? right of right. what could be happening, and the pressure to go get the money, go get the thing. You have you have the world on a, on on an on an oyster. The world's on a plate being offered up in front of you. Everything except music, right? Everything else is all the all the treaties, all the hard work and floors slept on and you know bounced checks and everything you know what i mean imagine all the, the 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 hardship of the life led you know and being a yeah. you know post-punk genius is very unsung and here they are they're about to taste something or they have the opportunity right yeah. it's in front of them i mean and so not... imagine they're all pulled and distracted and they're all thinking different things i would have to imagine right this is yeah. the, they're about to they have on the precipice of doing something that they think could be great and maybe some of them know that it's not great or that it won't work but but how do you turn it down or how do you say no to to all the riches in the world yeah it's like the same reason why a, why a lot of people have kids is because they leave they 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 lead unexamined lives and the, you know not everybody should be having fucking kids sure i think a lot less are having them than they used to thank god yeah yeah but but yeah, no, I mean, I think well, the, I don't know. You obviously you don't. There, I, there was a book called Book. We haven't even gotten to the one title, uh, right? The, right. the theory of their one title titles for records and things. Yeah. But but their book titled Book um, came out. Uh, I don't know, three or four years ago, and it had a little foreword. I think from from each band member, kind of it was you know, obviously you know post breakup and then post reunion, and this is the you know captures a lot of photos. You know, the, it's the great it's the great coffee table book if you're the fan that I am. Or you know yeah. that kind of a fan that you'd want to have you always wanted to have a coffee table book like this to see more because it wasn't always a lot of stuff like i said there weren't tons of interviews or photo spreads like we talked about you know with like nirvana or these good looking bands so they did their own book they mentioned in the foreword i think it's Dwayne dennison and that he he sort of saw in terms of their major label it makes it speaks more to to the next record to blue but there was you know but i think it's coming in here that they could have just broken up or they could have taken this this chance and i think at that point the business side sort of kicked in a little bit i don't know if they had a manager or i think Dwayne dennison's wife was kind of helping him out i think she had some kind of law degree or some kind of official you know stature in in society and i think advised them to just like guys you've worked your whole life. You've done all this stuff. You have an opportunity. Now everybody can go buy houses. You can go like, you know, don't end now just for the mechanics of living life as an adult. You guys are all, you guys have done this whole your entire life. You're probably getting into their forties here and whatever, whatever, if the wells run dry, it doesn't matter. These people are going to pay you all this money. Why, why turn it down just for your own, you know, pay off your car, pay off whatever it is you got to pay off. You know, I think there was a, that, I think there's a very mechanical life sort of decision that's the way Dwayne talked about it art's really funny i mean you can't just you can't just trick uh, art into being a certain way you can't yeah. you know this this it, without the direct connection of the thing that made jesus lizard its its own entity uh divorced from that this thing's just a bunch of noise yeah it's interesting too I mean, two of these songs have lyrics by other people like yeah right. singing songs written by someone else yeah destroyed before reading um and best and parts, best parts. The last one. Yeah. Best parts is awesome yeah yeah i mean i think you know like i said this is when i saw them live so i i give this one another kind of wide berth of like wow this is great this i love this mm -hmm. but you know it's but i could see on on you know i don't come back to it as much you know like i said show is sort of my spot this is where a playlist is going to be so amazing for this yeah. because you know, you got to save Mistletoe. You got to save Destroy Before Reading. Plus, you know, the last three songs, it, the record ends very strong. Elegy is cool, right? That's, again, kind of in that pastoral. Elegy is cool. Another kind of coding sort of yep. a thing. Even more so, Din and the best parts. Din is amazing. It's got that really sick slide guitar work. Again, it's completely nuts to me that they didn't explore this aspect of their song arranging just a bit further because it's only this and Nub off of goat that really showcase it and both are mind blowers yeah yeah interesting interesting you should have done more slide stuff yeah well i think you would go on to do that with other bands and other projects i wonder if it just pissed everybody off in the band this is tour. this record is not i don't think a sellout i just think it's growing pains i give it two and three quarter stars 
Yeah, I'm putting this down. I'll probably put this one at three just because there's low, the floor keeps going. That's very generous, sir. <laughs> <laughs> like I say, this is not objective. This is very, you're getting it from me who lived this life. It's your objective truth, bro. There's yeah, no... I went, I went and, and I, you know, they had, they had the record for sale. I'd already owned it on CD, but they were selling it at the merch table. I think I bought a t-shirt. I wore it to school the next day. I went to high school and everybody said, what is that? What that shirt you're wearing? I was like, this is the Jesus lizard. I saw them. I mean, it's funny. We didn't even have tickets the the, the again if, we're, if anybody's a fan of my own personal history um i didn't have tickets but we went to the show and it was sold out and uh, but my buddy that i went with he worked at uh, a shoe store in the mall and the security guard who was out front the big bouncer guy um mm -hmm. happened to be somebody who would, he recognized from shopping at the shoe store and so it was like hey buddy you know like we, we don't have tickets but we're you know we drove all the way out here from from the inland empire it was an hour out and uh He's like, if, if you let us in, if you're like, if you let us sneak in while well, like, I'll hook you up with some shoes next time you come in and it worked. Nice. So like just the, you know, just the machinations of being a teenager and trying to get to a show. We didn't buy tickets. We didn't know about that stuff. And just saw like, they're playing, we got to go and being able to sneak in. And he's like, yeah, he's like, as soon as you get in, just keep, just go. Like, don't, you can't come in and out, you know, like just be like, I'll turn my back and you guys just got to run in and just stay in the pit. I'm like, okay. Pretty good at talking my way into places too. And this one, this is like, I think four or five days before 9-11. Oh. I was in New York. What's it called? The Great American Music Hall? No. Is that the place? That's in San Francisco. That's Webster's, San Francisco. Webster's okay. It's something, something like that. Lowry Ballroom? Possibly. And Tenacious D was going to be playing there that night. I wanted Jack Black to star in a feature that I, I had just written. So that afternoon, uh, I got dressed up as one does when they go outside. And I just grabbed a briefcase. That was the only thing that got me in. A guy with a briefcase. <laughs> of course, post 9-11... The guy with the briefcase would never be allowed in. Right. But, they want to see inside of it. But uh, just the briefcase. I got in. The only two people in the building beside me was Jack Black and Jimmy Fallon. Oh. <clears throat> Jimmy Fallon was playing Benny and the Jets on piano, uh, actively listening to me as I pitched Jack Black on the on the film. I love doing that shit. Just all you need is a clipboard or a briefcase. Look like you're supposed to be there. That's, yeah, that's, that's, that's it. Long way. Yeah. All right. So we are at the end of phase one. Phase two, the big time beckons, a.k.a. what could possibly go wrong? 1995 to 1999. You ever see that Simpsons? Yes, exactly. Oh, that's the yeah. first thing that's ever gone wrong. I actually right, just exactly. watched that last time with my son. That's so funny. It's an itchy and scratchy world. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I'm so glad you know the reference. Okay. So they yeah. signed the Capitol in 1995. They recorded the song Panic and Cicero for the Clerk soundtrack. And really shortly thereafter, made appearances at Lollapalooza. Yeah. So, all right. First, <clears throat> let's, before we talk about Panic and Cicero, let's talk about uh, the idea of a band as uncompromising as these fuckers finding a tweaked version of their sound that appeals to a larger crowd. And how necessary was that, Randy? How necessary was it for them to go to Capitol? Well, or... the idea of uh, a really uncompromising band, you know, working on a tweaked version of their sound that appeals broader. Oh, I mean, I don't know. I, I think we, we've, we've said it. it. The results were dismal and, it, and it, something was lost. Right. It's it's so hard to know. When I look back at, at interviews that they did back in the 92 era, uh -huh. they give super terse, uninterested answers to pretty much everything thrown their way, especially Yao. Hmm. They were asked. So what's your name mean and who came up with it? Their answer was, we did and nothing. <laughs> so they, right. they seem like they'd rather go to sleep than give interviews. So yeah, yeah. with that in mind, it's just interesting that they decided to go for it. Yeah. I mean, like I said, you know, just for the the glimpses of what I've, you know, saw from that introduction to their book, you know, it definitely just sounded like they were tired mm -hmm. and they were probably creatively spent to some degree, but there was an opportunity to, to buy houses and to become adults, to go off, right. to, to end it on a creative downturn, but a financial win, which was probably smart, you know, and yeah. for, for, a, a, for men of their age and for, you know, for people and for whatever their lives, whatever the next phase of their life was going to be, why not walk out with their, with bags of, with dollar signs on them. They deserved it for all the great stuff they'd done. I'm sure they were not getting rich off of uh, touch and go. Not that Touch and Go didn't pay bands, you know what I mean, but just the 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 nature of of 
distribution and press and all that but stuff. But those types of bands, I mean, the Touch and Go, the Amphetamine Reptile, I mean, they weren't making sag. They weren't making, they didn't have to put their money in those uh, cartoon money bags. They could have just used an envelope. Right. But I'm sure they did well too. I mean, this was CD time, you know what I mean? CDs right. cost 99 cents to make. They sell them for 13 bucks, 15 bucks. It's, yeah. there was, there was a high profit margin there and those independent labels, I think had decent 50, 50 splits with the bands. So I'm sure they were making, you know, they were paying their rents and stuff, but it goes from, you know, paying rent on an apartment to buying a house out in the suburbs and, and setting yourself up for the, you know, whatever else what comes next. I don't know. I think I, this is my opinion of, of a man who has a house in the suburbs um, myself. So, you yeah. know, I mean, I can, I can understand the mechanics of why they would do that. Um, but creatively, I don't know. I, they must not have had it because obviously Mac left. You didn't have, you weren't married when uh, when you guys put out your first EPs, were you? No, no. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, I'm just, so, those things, yeah. No, those, yeah. yeah, yeah. Got married, got the, married in 2012. Weird. I think that's the only, actually the only stuff I haven't heard, for, heard from you guys is the non-Weirdo Ripper EP material. Oh yeah, it's out there. Yeah, we own yeah, yeah. all that stuff now. It's nice. We can, I think there's a reissue at some point in the works. Sweet. You know, yeah, it's out there. Yeah, I still have the, the digital eight track that I recorded it on. Nice. So, yeah. Uh, so, yeah. so their first stab at this thing, surprisingly to me, Panic and Cicero is a fucking classic. I think it's great. Do you like this song? I do. I do. It's funny. It's on, on a soundtrack, right? I mean, it's probably leftover material from early, from you know either down. I would have to imagine. You know what? I tend to doubt it, and the reason I could be totally wrong. But this is a statement of intent. The first part of the song, which is feels way more by rote, and then the song changes. Uh, it's unlike any song they've ever made. It, it comes in at a, a minute thirty two seconds. Yao howls at that point and then the subsequent guitar scronk freak out and the fucking screamo party that happens it actually turns into a drum solo which i fucking hate i hate drum solos <laughs> and uh he, dean probably hates drum solos but it's not uh, a show off you one it just kind of glides by in the pocket and for that reason it's really surprising and I think it works really, really well. I love this song so much. Yeah, it's, I think it's a great song. It's just funny. It's a funny release, right? I think it just it belies the the major label sort of marketing machine. Yeah, marketing and and this about. this is not Albini either. So right. uh, this is uh, Garth Richardson, who had done the Melvin Stoner Witch. Here's the trifecta of the Jesus Lizard downfall. No more Albini. No more Mac on drums and no more or a disrupted four letter album title streak. Oh, so that didn't happen until the self-titled Jesus lizard EP. But I feel like if you're superstitious, that was it. Then they yeah. fucked it up. Somehow they had like this really great approach for being able to, uh, you know, record for the majors and do it in a way where they not only maintained in, uh, their dignity, but uh, they were, you know, still making incredible and relevant music. That happened at least with the first song out of the gate, but uh, not much farther after that. So in 96, Shot comes. Oh, wh what are your thoughts on Panic and Cicero? Do you feel like I'm overrating it? No, no, I think it's, I think it is great. It totally works and holds up as a song. I, like I said, I think it, it feels like an older song. It doesn't feel like yeah, yeah. What, what they're going to be going into. So then we're at Shot, yeah. produced by um same guy, uh, Garth. Garth Richardson. And the feel, the vibe of the, of the record is definitely different. And also his vocals are, would you say they're much clearer and higher in the mix? Or, yeah, it's, it's but, disturbing, yeah. disturbingly high. Yeah, like for example, that aristocrats, that aristocrats joke. Right. You no, know, that song. His vocals are mixed way down in the mix, to where you really have to listen closely to be able to hear and understand these amazing lyrics. So for him to be spotlit like this is just generally a mistake. Yeah, that's not what you want from this band. Right, right. Yeah, I could see why somebody would do it. You know, why you and again, you wonder, is this a major label thing? Is this what, you know, they were told they needed to sound like? I can't imagine. Who thought it was a good idea? I mean, maybe, maybe, yeah, it was his secret. He wanted to be this heard. I don't know. Yeah. It, feels, it feels just like a bad production. And, and again, they're just doing whatever they think they're supposed to be doing. In general, going into shot here. How are your feelings about this record? Again, to me, it's just like a why. I remember hearing it at the time, you know, and being excited. Oh, cool. There's another record. This feels different. This, oh, yeah. I don't know. 
you know, just it was one of those kind of like the there was no more smoke in the air. It just kind of mm-hmm. felt like, OK, well, kind of a shrug, like, well, I guess, you know, and I mean, I don't think I even bought it. I know maybe this was like something I listened to at Blockbuster Music, you know, when you can do that thing where they let you uh, listen to CDs before you bought them. Yeah. Being like, eh, well, that's that's no good. This one, it really peters out. I mean, at least the first half of the record, uh, I think you have three great songs. So, yeah, that Skull of a German, I think, was kind of where it falls off. Yeah, I like that one. I mean, I like that song, but I think that oh, was yeah, the yeah. end. And then yeah, it kind of, after that, it's yeah. a fucking piece of shit is what it is. Yeah. Uh, it really sucks. But let's focus first on the, the first half of the record. Thumper is, I think, incredible. It's got a tricky time signature, pretty furious performance, really great opener. And there's moments, again, where they sound like dead ringers for the Minutemen which is high praise. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. It's tight. Yeah. But there's just, it doesn't, you don't hear the room. You don't hear the air around those drums. Right. It just feels too, the bass isn't growling enough. The bass is too clean. The voice is too clean. Yeah. Yeah. They lost some of the muck that made it so special. Are you generally, I mean, do you ever throw this on or never? No, never. I mean, really honestly, this and the next one, I had to listen to this morning just to kind of hear what it sounded like. I'm like, yeah. Okay. I listened to this once. I think when, when it came out, Said it wasn't for me. Moved on, mm-hmm. and then um, the other one I hadn't blue. I never even heard. So Ooh, I listened to it. This that, that's that's rough fucking going. But this for one, a band I love so much. You know what I mean? It's yeah. like, oh yeah, no, I just remembered it. Like kind of stopped there. There's some great stuff on this though. Again, blue shot, the second song, fucking awesome. This is easily the most evil, down tune, raging, raw throated belter about a picnic that I've ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah get yeah just yeah i'm putting it on right now and just like it's just so clean it just doesn't feel right like it feels like a demo or something if you're kind of easy on them you give them a pass on this because it's still a really good song but you know it's like if you're a super passionate stones fan which are you no my mom loves rolling stones i've seen them now i think seven times just because my mom loves them so much so i am not i don't know everything there is to know so the you know the transition from Exile on Main Street and and uh, uh, and Goat's Head Soup into It's Only Rock and Roll. Now you had a logo that goes with the band. Mm, oh, this is their 70s arena. Vibe. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, it was like the first, for, and, and any song about rocking out, there's, <laughs> there's going to be a disconnect there. It's not, it just doesn't plumb deep enough, right? So yeah. these are, at, at, at their best, these are very finely crafted rock songs. But that's it. The... The above and beyondness of it all is gone. Yeah, the bloom or, is off the road. Or maybe not completely gone, but it's it's quickly dissipating. And it just feels like, I think when I listen to it, it just feels like they've done better versions of these songs. Right. They haven't changed. They haven't become a disco rock band or or a garage rock band. They still, the, 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 the elements of what make them them, their sound and their their playing ability is there minus the drummer, you know, who's doing a good imp- impersonation of Mac. So, you know, it wasn't like they suddenly all bought Ferraris and started doing Coke and now there's chorus and flange on everything. Right. So they didn't totally, they didn't totally shit the bed. So I think, you know, it's, it's good to, it's within perspective, but for them as a band who I love so much and had such classic rocking songs, I don't know, Albini was a big part of it, I guess. You know, with the, the, him yeah. not being there, it signals the fall, right? They're just like, oh, wow. To have I all those things happen at once, uh, yeah. they had to have felt unmoored from that point forward. The drummer, producer, new label, like just, yeah. and those things don't necessarily make the band. Mac obviously does, but, you know, but they're obviously, we'd, it was hard to know how much good influence and goodwill that brought to them in, their, in yeah. those records. What it, by the way, what did you give Panic? Oh, oh, Panic, just as a song. We're going, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, oh, I would put that. I put that at four. Yeah. The third song, Thumb Screws. I like that one too. It's a revenge song about their supposedly shitty landlord. <laughs> it's only slightly less impressive, kind of J Liz light with some typically amazing, again, with that fucking bottleneck slide. There's only like less than five songs where they really actively feature that. But yeah. the, the the slide on this is phenomenal. Yeah, but the voice is still so clean. And yeah, maybe he's doing the yowling kind of thing, but it's just isn't. Yeah. yeah, and the drummer. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. The drums just don't feel as like it's it just 
feels like it going through the motions. Yeah. Then you get a couple a couple more songs where they're, I, I agree, they're going through the motions. Good riddance. You know, it's got that fucking creepy crawly thing going mm-hmm. on. But it does at least feature the line, and the clown became a jagoff. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I'll tell you, the creeping, uh, the creeping dread thing that they do, the closer that these guys fly to the corporate sun, the less I'm buying that kind of vibe from them. Right. Yeah. Maybe there's something to be said with the presentation of it. Mm-hmm. How dangerous could Contact. you be? Yeah. And it's also, yeah, for how long can you do it too? There's something immediate about it. And like, whoa, so shocking. And then it comes back again. And it's it's the damned if you do, damned if you don't, right? If they change, yeah. they suck, they sell it out, they changed. If you don't change, then you're just regurgitating your same bullshit. How a do you man really like this doesn't that? need to mature. In my in my estimation, I mean, you look at you know certain bands, you know, as you well know, I'm wrapping up the the pavement series right now. Right. Those guys, you could never have seen that the same band that made Bright in the Corners wound up making uh, Slay tracks. It doesn't seem like the same guys, right. but with with the Jesus lizard, you don't want there to be any maturation going on with these. <laughs> it was it was so well formed right out of the right out of the yeah. yeah yeah popped out pretty good yeah 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 I mean I uh, honestly yeah I could I could zoom through all of this from here on out I I, I I'm going to become more of a bump on the log I don't have much to say about these let's slow really... down and really really uh, <laughs> all right pervertedly so... slow. Yeah, so Good Riddance stinks. Mailman's kind of shitty. Skull of a German. I, uh, it sounds like we both like that. Yeah, I, I yeah, it was it was funny. It was almost reminding me of like Slayer lyrics or something, where you know you take like something from history and you like some atrocity of the World War Two thing, you know, uh, uh, and you, you know, I'm trying to form some kind of lyric based around it. Do you know what this is about? No, no, it's about this guy broke into the the uh jay liz's dressing room while they were on stage at Lollapalooza in 95 and he bled all over the catering took off his clothes uh stole david sims's clothes oh. and and security found him uh hiding in their in their bathroom the security actually offered to allow the band to beat the shit out of him if they wanted to but Ugh. apparently he was just so fucking sad and helpless. They booted him out of there and wrote the song. Wow. This is a great song, I think. Otherwise, for the rest of the record, the only other good song is Now Then. Um, I know you don't feel as passionately about it as I do, but for 1996's shot, I'm going to go with two and a half stars. I'll put it at two, just because oh, still, okay. still sound still sounds like them. Still you know a rock I mean? band. Yeah, they would they would have to they would have to yeah be pretty bad to go to the zero or the one category. It still it, sounds like the band. After a bunch of touring the following year, this particular lineup uh, recorded 1998 self titled EP, which is their the only record they have whose title is not a four letter word. It sucks. Yeah, there's production and engineering by Andy Gill of uh, Gang of Four. Yeah, John, John Kale, Kale John Kale, Jim O'Rourke. The hell? Um, and then they did Blue. Yeah, this Jesus Lizard EP. I make. I mean, I'm giving it the one. It's a interesting the way they set this up was to basically they were trying out different producers they were auditioning them and then using the results on a finished work which is again just like the stones for black and blue when um mick taylor left the band they were trying out different guitarists and the rehearsals they would put on this record similar kind of a deal but as an active audition ground for producers instead of guitarists on um, the jesus lizard ep i think there's only one great song cold water it sounds like it's about a dude in a wheelchair sitting in a basement while flood water rises around him it's a great fucking song i think valentine is an instrumental the only other song i would conceivably recommend it's probably also one other <laughs> one other thing is Eyesore from this record, not a great song, but probably the best song ever written about revenge impregnating a KKK member's five daughters. God. <laughs> really only necessary for Cold Water, not to mention Valentine. Overall, this feels like square peg, round hole kind of shit to me. I give it two and three quarter stars. Yeah, I'm going with a one on that one. One? Yeah. After that, we have Blue. Blue is just a complete piece of shit. It really, yeah, really. Yeah, no, yeah. This is not artwork I would want to have. It, it's awful. This is uh, Andy Gill produced it for him. Uh, there is nothing that I would recommend from this. Nothing. It's alternative rock in the year 1998. That's all it is. Yeah, Horse so, Doctor Man. That's rough. Th- this one, I'm giving one star, but I'm I'm being nice. Yeah, I'll go with you. One. Yeah. All right. In August 1998, Kimball left the group, was replaced by Brendan Murphy on drums. A few more months of heavy touring, and then they played the final gig of their initial career 
in Sweden on March 27, 1999. They just failed to find a commercial success. And honestly, I don't think that they were ever cut out for it. I don't think it never would have happened. After being dropped from Capital mid-contract, they announced their split the following June <clears throat> in 99. A, a CD called Bang came out in 2000. Seven Inch best of. 30s. There's some cool stuff on that. A couple things worth mentioning. Uncommonly Good and The Test. Those two songs I'm going to pull off you know, onto the playlist. Uh, the members remained musically active from the band, but of most importance, in 2006... Yao and Sims reformed Scratch Acid. For the Touch and Go reunion? Yeah, exactly. Anniversary, the, yeah. Uh, 25th anniversary. So a week before the festival, uh, the reunited Scratch Acid played to a sold-out crowd at Emo's in Austin. Yao moved to Los Angeles, worked in graphic design for an ad agency, joined the band Kui. Yeah, Kui. Yeah, I know Kui. those guys. Yeah. Are they good? Uh, they kind of sounded like Jesus Lizard a little bit. Yes, they're cool. They're like I like that, but they've they've gone on to do a lot of different stuff. But yeah, that that time when they were, when they had Yao in the band, it definitely sounded a lot like Jesus Lizard. There's been a couple of reunion tours. 2008, the second reunion was 2017. I saw them on both of those. I saw the 2008. We played a, a All Tomorrow's Parties up in upstate New York. That's right. I think it was Flaming Lips curated um, mm-hmm. one and uh, and. Yeah, I actually jumped up on stage and ripped uh, David Yao's shirt off. Oh, nice! <laughs> that is awesome, dude. Nice yeah, it was. It felt appropriate at the time. <laughs> I felt I was over. I was overcome with joy to see them again. It was really that's yeah, so excited. cool. And then the 2017, I saw them also. Who do you go to a Jesus Lizard concert with? Uh, my, my good friend uh, Noel Paris. He has a studio called Bionic Ear down in, in Orange County, and I knew he was a fan, and so I had asked him. You know, I got tickets and asked if he wanted to go. Yeah, we had a great time. I'll tell you one thing for sure. If they if they get back together again, I will definitely be there. So I want to talk about uh, the overview and shape of their arc. They were the stooges of the 90s, a perfectly perfect distillation of the raw, uncompromising spirit of dick-flashing, performative, thrill-seeking, and pure limit-flirting rock and roll. But just like dirty old men fantasize about sullying the innocence of eyelash-batting young women, So too did record companies in the 90s seem to almost consciously set out to ruin the innate perfection of all that was good and noble during that decade's indie scene. But we still have that first five years of their career to prove that they had what it took once upon a time to fuck up your kids and keep them that way forevermore. Their top three records, the third one, I'm going to go with Liar, the second one, Head, and the first one, I'll give you one motherfucking good goddamn guess. The worst album, 1998's Blue, pure garbage. How about yourself, sir? I think I'm right there with you. I, I would throw in Show, though. Because, and again, like I said, you know, this was kind of my yeah. favorite record. I think Show and Lash have to have some kind of standing up there. Obviously, I think Goat, you know, because that's where the majority of those songs first originated from on, on yeah. Show. So I would say, yeah, you know, we got to, I would probably put Goat, Show, Liar, and then lash, and then head. That would probably be my. That's the order I would go for my top five. And then worst, yeah, blue, and then self-titled. Yeah, the, those are just indefensible. We did it. We got to the end. Oh my god! Your wife Easy. didn't kill you. I want to thank you. I have four kids' birthday parties to go to today. Just Holy so you know, this is shit, dude. <laughs> this is what I. So this is you. You. I think you hit the nail on the head. Yes, I'm. I've been. I've enjoyed this thoroughly, but I am about to go bang my head on on the wall or at the park. <laughs> you know, yeah, smash your head on the punk rock. Yes. Yeah. So you. I mean, obviously, you have people helping people coming out and you yes. got a score coming out yes. so talk to me about plugging things oh, okay i've heard the record it's well worth plugging it's another in a long line of masterworks tell oh. me what you want to plug sir <laughs> yes well yeah people helping people is out on drag city it's available on all three on all the streamers you know and for and for a band going on our what is this our sixth or seventh full-length record and and you know over here talking shit about jesus lizard getting old on their side i can't help but hopefully <laughs> not feel hypocritical it is tough and i have i have absolute empathy and sympathy for for all bands you know who make more than one record it is, it is not easy to do, you know, and I, I, I yeah. can understand that all. So Dean and I are continually challenging each other and pushing each other, which I think makes for interesting art, hopefully. And we're finding, you know, that 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 center of the Venn diagram of what he's into and what I'm into is perpetually shifting and moving. And so I think that's literally where, you know, we've had to kind of come to this understanding of like that where our two interests, you know, crossover is where no age exists. So because we, we sort of look at every every new record as that, you know, the 
window of what defines what no age can be. You know, hopefully we're right. changing maturing or, or just changing and keeping it interesting. I think this new record is, is definitely a different one. It's kind of more of a studio experimental project where the last record we did was called Goons Be Gone, also for Drag City is our uh, second one for them. But that was that was going to be you know, full of hubris and that we didn't understand. That was our live record. That was the live one that we wrote just to take out on the road because we were so excited to go to, to tour for the summer of 2020. Unbeknownst to us, you know, what we, little did we know what was coming for the summer of 2020. Right. And uh, so it was a funny kind of pivot. So I think this record kind of comes out there. Anyway, but I'm just pitching. If I don't like your record, I, I'm just not going to bring up that it's a good idea for you to plug it. I appreciate it. Uh, Thanks. You guys are consistently great. You have so much integrity. It's oozing from your collective aesthetic pores. Oh my um, God. What I is do, your? I, I do my best to try to sell out on every record. And Dean yeah, me, that's me an honest DIY man. My brother, uh, any artist that's going to release an ambient song from their new record of actual songs <laughs> has a zero single. interest in selling out. That's true. All right, that just about does it. Thank you so much for joining us. A heartfelt discography thanks goes out to our graphic designer, Todd Zimmer, Patreon superstar and chief of staff, Corbin Betleon, my beautiful wife and son, Jen and Mason, Randy Randall, Drag City, and the entire Soldier of Sound Patreon community. I love you, and this show would not exist without you. Be sure to stay tuned, because this Tuesday brings upon us another incredible episode of Discographies, The Private Press with Paul Major, wherein you'll be introduced to a whole new world of music there's little chance you've heard before. This week, it's the biker come down of Circuit Rider. And then there's this Thursday's wildcard episode as well. A super superb hour-long interview with No Age's Randy Randall that's as intimate as intimate gets. Of course, as well, you'll want to tune in a week from today for Trip to Fantasy, premiering on Christmas Day which is two days prior to the day my wife and son and I get the fug out of Dodge and plow through climate change snowstorms 3,000 miles to New Jersey and Vermont, and all for the love of this blend of sound our ear holes need to thrive and stay alive. It's for you, but it's for me too. Stay gold, motherfuckers. It's Discography. Discography.